Hidden San Francisco, the guide to lost landscapes, unsung heroes, and radical histories. This is stop L11 at Harry Bridges Plaza between the south and northbound roadways of the Embarcadero at the foot of Market Street. Naming the plaza in front of the ferry building in the late 1990s for Harry Bridges was claimed by labor activists as a great victory for the working class. Plans are still out there to erect a monument to the man, but have so far not come to fruition. If the Bridges statue is ever erected, it may ironically serve to underline how his life demonstrated the power of capital to absorb moments of radical opposition, using the energy of the working class against itself. When Harry Bridges departed this world in March 1990, he left behind a unique institution, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, ILWU. His legacy and the meaning of the union's history is still being discovered. From its origins in the 1934 big strike, the ILWU helped transform the lives of countless men who worked the waterfront, but more crucially, the ILWU helped tip the balance of power in San Francisco's class struggle decisively toward the working class during its glorious and glorified early history in the 1930s and 40s. Bridges himself rose to lead the rank and file movement for union recognition, democracy, and a hiring hall. These achievements in the mid-1930s were crucial victories in the hard-fought battles of the Depression-era class war. Bridges famously defended the rights of everyday workers to control their own fate, and he also led the vital effort to integrate African-American workers into the Longshore Union. Strike after strike in San Francisco had been broken by using non-union African-American workers, who for the most part could only get hired as strike breakers, as they were systematically excluded from the racist white unions. After World War II, Harry Bridges was repeatedly put on trial by the federal government as part of its larger efforts to weaken organized labor and root out perceived communists and communist influence. Thanks to grassroots organizing by rank-and-file longshoremen and other workers, combined with skillful legal defense by Vincent Hallinan and others, Bridges was able to defeat most of the cases against him, although he was saved more than once by appeals courts overturning guilty verdicts of lower courts. I'm an officer of a left-wing trade union, and that's the way those people think, and as long as my rank and file feel that way, my job is to represent them that way. What do you mean by a left-wing trade union? Well, obviously on the record it's a union that means uh, that that's willing to arbitrate. Uh, to start with, that's a matter of record. It's also a union that believes in uh, a lot of rank-and-file democracy and control. It's also a union that recognizes that from time to time it's got to stand up and fight for certain things that might necessarily only be wages, hours, and conditions. Civil liberties, racial equality, and things like that. The technological linchpin of the world economy is the shipping container without which production could not have been exported to the far reaches of the planet. In 1960, Bridges and the leadership of the ILWU presided over a bitter fight in the Union that led to the Mechanization and Modernization Agreement, m, &M which allowed for the containerization of shipping and the division of the longshoring workforce into tiers, known as A, B, and Casual, followed six years later by the rise of the Steady Men to operate the new high-tech cranes. In making this agreement, the ILWU was the first trade union in the United States to agree formally to trade control of technology, work rules, and the pace of work for money and pensions. In so doing, they struck a favorable financial deal for the workers then employed, but also ushered in a process that has radically expanded the power of capital at the expense of workers worldwide. Bridges went further than making a trade union agreement that benefited his own workers at the expense of the working class more broadly. Recognized as a labor statesman in the wake of the m, m agreement, he was named to the Port Commission, while a number of other ILWU officials took positions with the Redevelopment and Planning Commissions. Alio appointed truckloads of union officials to the city government. The international president of the ILWU, Harry Bridges, went to the Port Commission. Stanley Jensen, the machinist, went to the Redevelopment Agency, as did Joe Mosley of the ILWU. Hector Rueda of the Elevator Construction Workers went to the City Planning Commission, and Bill Chester, also from the ILWU, became the president of BARD. In the mid-1960s, local real estate magnate Ben Swig 
targeted hotels and apartments on 3rd and 4th streets in the south of Market for redevelopment. These were precisely where longshoremen and seamen who had been part of the 1930s class upsurge had retired and were living in dense but comfortable housing. Now, George Wolf sent a letter to Harry Bridges, asking Harry Bridges to hear our side. We told him, you heard redevelopment side, now we'd like you to come down and hear, hear our side. Now, George Wolf was a big organizer for, for, the, national, uh, for the ILWU. Yet Harry Bridges was the president at ILW, and it was guys like George Wolf and myself that raised all the money to help him to get out of it when he was accused of being a communist and they tried to deport him. We were two of the main guys that went out to raise money to defend him. Uh, Harry Bridges' answer to our letter was that I heard redevelopment side. The redevelopment side is good enough for me. I don't want to hear your side. A decade-long fight over what is now the Yerba Buena Gardens spearheaded by retired communist waterfront workers like Peter Mendelssohn and George Wolfe, created a number of low-income senior apartments in the area and also defeated Swig's plans for a 70,000-seat football stadium and a dozen 50-story office towers, giving us instead the gardens, museums, and amenities we have there now. During this bitter fight, Bridges and the Union sided consistently with the local business elite and its government planners against the very men who had originally created the Union and gave it its fiercely democratic nature. In 1971, a 109-day rank-and-file strike against renewing the West Coast Longshore contract due to the Steady Men provision was channeled by Bridges and his allies into a small wage increase and weak rules on Union jurisdiction over stuffing, i.e. packing, the containers. Nearly a half century later, the rank and file still has the right to elect its leaders, but as with, with many formal democracies, it has become an increasingly empty ritual. The much praised union democracy has fallen pretty far, with a bare 20% of the ILW's members bothering to participate in recent elections. A monument for Harry Bridges, if it is ever built, would further solidify an amnesiac and glorified understanding of a complicated past. On the other hand, if we challenge the unspoken assumptions and explore the lost history surrounding Bridges, the ILWU, and San Francisco's endless class war, perhaps we can use this proposed monument to reveal much more than is intended. <laughs>